So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the epistle to, to the Colossians in the New Testament, Colossians. And uh, this will be the final uh, installment of the series uh, about how do we walk pleasing to the Lord? How do we walk pleasing to the Lord? And uh, uh, we've uh, had several messages around that in the last, uh, uh, well, maybe a month or so, a couple of months ago. And there was a trip in between where I was away. But uh, we've been looking, we've been looking at how uh, we could be pleasing to the Lord. And, and, uh, and certainly today we want to look again into this passage as Paul prayed for this church. And what were the things that he was uh, praying for? What did he want to see instilled in the life of this church? So we saw in previous weeks to be pleasing was to know his will and to walk in it. To, to, uh, to understand the will of God and, and to perform it, being obedient to Him. And we looked at that, we said, well, uh, we need to know more of God's Word. Uh, we need, and remember we had the exercise of going through the, the book of Proverbs, right? Reading a proverb a day and try to glean from that uh, at least one principle, one principle. And I pray that uh, you haven't just stopped that. Uh, you haven't stopped that exercise of, uh, of uh, because we just did it for a month. I, I pray that that would be a habit now, uh, that you, when you read, you look for something in God's Word, a principle, uh, something that can help you. And remember what we said, if you can learn just one truth, right, one truth a day, one truth a day, uh, that is 365 in a year. Now imagine how smart you'll become in 10 years. Uh, you know, in 10 years' time, uh, uh, you're going to have 3,650 new things that you, that you have learned and, and you have practiced in your life. And, and can you imagine how much great wisdom then you have? Uh, you know, wisdom is not gaining knowledge, but also the application of knowledge. That's what it means. Uh, it's knowing how to put something into practice. And that's where wisdom comes in. So uh, we could all become very wise people when we read the Word of God, understand what, it, what God has for us, and if we're obedient to it, our lives can be transformed by it. So this is why it's important for us to know the will of God through His Word. And we also looked at uh, the uh, walking worthy to the Lord unto all pleasing through our fruitfulness. And that uh, we had a dying tree in the foyer. And I think it's still dying. I'm not sure if anybody's tried to revive it yet. It's, uh, it's out the front somewhere. I've had a, a few volunteers who said, Pastor, don't throw it. We're going we're gonna to attempt to revive it. Well, uh, the, I don't know what's happening with the tree yet, but uh, it's coming, is it? It's coming. All right. So there's a challenge there of reviving that tree. And what we wanted really is for us to go and do some good deeds. Uh, you know, we were saved unto good works. And we explained that, that the scripture clearly shows us that good works are a help to us. And, uh, and they are hope to us eternally. But what they can never do, what they can never do is, uh, trans, uh, is to take us out of that judgment and condemnation into an everlasting hell and, and take us to heaven. They, they, however, for a Christian, uh, will be rewarded. You'll get rewarded for your good works and God will give you rewards for that as you try it by fire. And for the unsaved, someone who did not trust Jesus Christ as their Savior, the good works will be used in determining how much of a punishment you'll have for all of eternity. So, uh, yes, good works are, are helpful for every individual for eternity, but good works will never, ever save you. Good works will never get you out of that judgment seat. Uh, only the blood of Jesus Christ and, uh, and His completed work on the cross uh, can be the full payment on your behalf uh, for that judgment. So we need to run to Jesus and ask him to help us. And so we need to bear some good fruits. And I hope you've been continuing with that. I hope you have been uh, looking around for the needs of others and doing acts of good works and kindness to uh, others, even more so to the household of faith. Paul teaches us that in Galatians chapter 6. Uh, be not weary in well-doing. But, uh, uh, but to just to keep going and doing all that we can to please the Lord and we ought not to quit. And then we looked at, as we uh, walk pleasing to the Lord, uh, we looked at how we can be changed by the knowledge of God. Remember, uh, what God wants to do is once He saved you is not just to take you to heaven, but to transform your life and to change you. 
to be more like Jesus. And the more we are exposed to Him and we're exposed to His Word, the more we notice of what is needed to change. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, there's transformation that takes place in every believer. You know, the fruit, the fruit that is there, the fruit that, that determines and, and shows whether you are truly born again is the fruit of a transformed life. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. God begins to strip away the old life. The Spirit of God will begin to convict you and show you a better way. And things that you need to start taking off and some things that you need to start putting on. And uh, Paul even explains this in this, uh, in this little epistle to the Colossians. A great epistle. Uh, if, you can, if you take time to read it uh, during the week. And uh, the Lord wants to do that work in us. He wants to transform our lives. And as he transforms us and we become like Christ, then we are pleasing to him. We are walking pleasing to him. And last week we looked at uh, how, we, uh, how, how the Lord is pleased when we, uh, when we are strengthened by his power. And as we are strengthened by his power, we are able to have endurance, as uh, patience and long-suffering, being able to forbear one another, live peaceably with one another, and to do that joyfully, with joyfulness. So uh, if you haven't listened to those messages, maybe go back and uh, have a look at them on our website, and download them, have a, have a listen uh, in this series. So to, this morning we're going to look at the last trench of that, and that's verse 12, verse 12. So if we could stand in honor of le- reading God's word, let's do so. Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, give you a chance to stretch your legs before you sit down again, Colossians 1. And uh, we're going to read from verse 9 through to verse 12. Uh, Sorry, verse 1 through to verse 14. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and uh, and increasing in the knowledge of God strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness and today let's pay attention to verse 12 giving thanks unto the lord father unto the father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who have delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins. May the Lord add the blessing to the reading of his word. Father, we come to you now and as we sit and Lord, as we listen, we pray, Father, that this would not be just uh, an oratory speech of a man, but we pray, Lord, that the Spirit of God will take the word of God and minister these truths to us and we be changed by it. Help us, Lord, to learn today how to walk all pleasing to you Father, I pray that you would give me strength and help, uh, that you would give me the words that need to be spoken to minister and to edify your people today. And Lord, we will receive your word with gladness today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, last uh, last Sunday when we looked at uh, how we needed the power of God to endure and to forbear. And uh, we looked at that, that the way it needs to happen is through joyfulness. Uh, God will give you his joy as you will endure and as you forbear. And, and we said that the difference between joy and happiness is this, uh, is this truth. Happiness is in our surroundings and in our circumstances, but joy is placed in the person of Jesus Christ. The one who never changes, the one who anchors himself, uh, where he is our anchor, and uh, the one who, who can give us all grace and strength to be able to endure and pass through whatever trial and tribulation that we go through. He promised to be with us and never to forsake us. So uh, as we think about Christianity, uh, it is one that is filled with joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength, is what the Bible says. And as we live life then with this very joy, then the outpouring of that, the outward appearance of that is now thankfulness. And so this is where Paul brings us into this prayer. He says that giving thanks unto the Father, being able to give thanks to the Lord. 
uh, I, I appreciate being around people who have gratitude and can say thank you. And we teach our kids, don't we, uh, when something is done for them to say thank you, please and thank you. And uh, it's good to have that kind of spirit of gratitude to be thankful, saying thank you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for preparing the meal. Thank you for washing my clothes. Thank you for ironing my clothes. Thank you, for Dad, for working really hard and providing for us. It is a wonderful spirit when we have a spirit of gratitude, being thankful uh, for what we have. Now, you know what happens is that we are thankful for the good things. All we can say is thank you when something nice is happening. Uh, if it's something we're enjoying, if it's according to what we're looking for and that uh, we're satisfied with, well, it's easy to come and say, thank you. But I wonder how many of us, how many of us have said, thank you, Lord, for the, my trial. Uh, Lord, thank you even for this sickness that I have. Uh, Lord, uh, thank you for, uh, you know, that I lost my job. I wonder whether we can be people of thanksgiving when the hardship comes around. When the things that we don't enjoy come around. You see, what the, what the Lord wants to do is uh, to anchor us in Him and that joy that he, give us, he gives us that there would be an outward presentation, there would be an outward pouring of thanksgiving to Him. And this is what Paul was trying to show this, this church in Colossae, is that uh, we, we would be pleasing to the Lord if we are people who know how to give thanks. Lord, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing in my life. Lord, thank you for what you have given me. Uh, Lord, thank you even for this trial. Lord, thank you that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. See, the psalmist was very thankful for all that God was doing in his life. I wonder whether we could be people of thanksgiving. Can we truly give God uh, uh, the expression of thankfulness uh, from the bottom of our hearts when we endure, when we do it, when we're going through trials of suffering? Now, why, why should we why should we be people of thanks? And this is uh, what Paul is trying to show here the church. Why should, we have, why should we have a spirit of thankfulness? And so Paul outlines here in these verses, in verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet. And that word there, made, has made us meet, uh, that is a word that means he has qualified us. You might want to write that in your margin. Uh, it means that God has qualified us. Uh, he has enabled us, in other words, or, or made us fit, made us fit uh, to share, look what it says, to be partakers, that is to share in the inheritance of the saints that walk in light. Now, that is something to be glad and to rejoice in. And that is something to give thanks to the Lord, because this very truth uh, is something that uh, we need to really understand. I am not going to heaven because I was good enough for it. You see, a lot of, a lot of people think, well, you know, of course, uh, uh, I've tried my best and, and through my religious acts and through my righteousness, and I can show God that I was good enough. I've paid my dues. I've paid for my sin. Uh, uh, I should be able to get to heaven by my works. I mean, hopefully I've done enough. Well, the Bible never teaches us that it is by our own righteousness that we are saved. The Bible tells us that we are saved by His mercy. It's His grace. It is His working. Uh, understand this. Uh, if heaven really is God's home, if heaven is God's home, like you have a say in who comes in, He has a say in who comes into His, into his kingdom. And, uh, what the, and the way that there's only one way to enter into that is that one door, which is Christ Jesus having faith in Him. Uh, that's the door. That's the entranceway. And uh, when you put your trust in Christ, the Bible says that God then says, yep, you're fit. You're fit to be a partaker of this kingdom. You're, you're fit now. You're qualified for you to come into eternity with me. See, He does the qualifying. We don't qualify ourselves. This is not 
a race where you go and you run and try to beat your time and try to qualify to get into the grand final. No, it is Jesus who qualifies us. It is God himself who qualifies us when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. If you have today aspirations and hope that you want to enjoy the inheritance that God has prepared for his people, then the only qualifier for you today is the person of Jesus Christ. It is God who qualifies us to enter into his kingdom. It is not by our works. It's not by what we have done. It's not by what we have presented to him. No, it's just that simple faith of coming and acknowledging Jesus died for me and I believe that. He was buried. He rose again and he made that payment on my behalf. And Lord, I cast myself upon you. And Lord, you're the only one who can save me. When we come with that simple faith and with that profession from our mouth and belief in our heart, the Bible says that we are saved. And what that truly means is that we have now been qualified to gain the inheritance of heaven with all those who walk in the light. Now, I, if I was you, I, I would want to cry out a hallelujah. I want to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done, uh, that you have not made it difficult. You know, I've said this to people, if God said to you, no, for you to qualify for heaven, you need to crawl on your hands and knees from here to Melbourne. And people will say, well, that's, a, that's extreme, but I, I can guarantee you there will be many who will attempt it. But here God is so merciful and gracious to us that he has not put us through any of these sacrifices that needed to be done because Christ made the ultimate sacrifice. Jesus died in our place, in our stead, and he has made it free for us to get into heaven. Now, that is something to rejoice and to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done. And because of what you completed on the cross of Calvary, we are now, by faith, as we accept him, we become qualified, enabled in order, enabled to enter and join into that great inheritance. It's a wonderful thing to say, thank you, Lord. Hey, what, when, whatever you're going through, no matter how down you may be, you have still something to say thank you to the Lord for. Lord, thank you for qualifying me into this inheritance. Uh, what a great place we're going to be in the presence of the Lord. Hey, listen, uh, uh, the Bible tells us things about heaven and uh, what is there. And, and, uh, and for me, the most important thing in heaven is that Jesus is present there. Uh, what, what's important for me is, is not so much that we're going to live in peace and tranquility in service of Jesus Christ, although these are great things. The most important thing is I am in the presence of my Savior. Listen, the, the, the tragic thing that we need to re understand uh, is that if we don't trust Christ, we're going to be separated from him for all of eternity. You're not going to be in the presence of God. Whether you like it or not today, God's Spirit is, is here. God's Spirit is working through the lives and trying to draw people to a saving knowledge of Christ. But there's a place in all of eternity where God will not be present there. And you will be away from His face for all of eternity. Now think about that. And, uh, and, uh, and that would be the, 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 the greatest trauma of it all, that we are away from God and His presence for all of eternity. But He wants to give you a great inheritance. There's a great inheritance awaiting for all of us. In fact, the Bible says that we are joint heirs with Christ. Uh, God has prepared a great kingdom and a great place, and uh, he wants to give that to you to dwell with him for all of eternity. And the one who qualifies us for that is God himself. And we're qualified by the blood of Christ. When we come by accepting, repenting, accepting Christ, we're able to have uh, that joint inher inheritance. Now, not only are we thankful for that joint inheritance, continue with me in verse, 4, in verse 13. Uh, we have something to thank God for, verse 13, who has delivered us from the power of darkness. He's rescued us from the power of darkness, and uh, look what it says, and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Uh, uh, understand what, what the transaction was. Understand what God did for you and for me. Get, understand what is available to us through the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, understand here the great power of God in our salvation. The Bible says that he has taken us from a kingdom of darkness uh, into his kingdom of light, into his great kingdom. 
Uh, you, you know, when you were born into this world, uh, you were born uh, as, a, as a pagan heathen, uh, that as you grew up, you came to a realization that you were a sinner and that you needed Christ to save you. Now, the Bible says, Jesus says to the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. And so when we were before salvation, guess where we were? We were in that kingdom of darkness. Uh, we had no great light. We had no great hope. Uh, we couldn't know whether we were going up or down. Uh, we didn't know what really the answer to life really is. We tried to drink from different wells. We tried partying. We tried money. We tried, you know, enjoyment and the pleasures of this world. But it all failed and always left a hole in our heart. And we felt like, what is the answer? It felt like we were walking in darkness. Have you ever woken up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and all the lights are off? And uh, your eyes haven't adjusted? And you're like, I don't know, am I, am I going to hit the dresser? Am I going to stump my toe on the chair? Am I going to make it there? And uh, you, you, just, you just, you don't know, you, right? You, you're just confused. And that uh, life before Christ is filled with much confusion. Uh, we really don't have a straight answer. We, we're really just in a lot of doubt, wishing and hoping that maybe I'm on the right path, maybe I'm not. Maybe this is really the answer to life, maybe it isn't. But, but what God has done, and we need to be thankful for, is that he has moved us from what? From this world of darkness into his kingdom of light, his great kingdom of light. I'm thankful that the Lord has given me his light. Are you grateful that he's given you light in your life? Hey, yeah, you, you are able to discern and able to decide uh, what is pleasing to the Lord and what isn't pleasing. Hey, before, before we were saved, you know, the only le leading that we ever had is, did it make me feel good? You know, you hear people say, yeah, you know, oh, I'm not sure what I should do, mom. I'm not sure what I should, dad. Well, what does your heart tell you to do? Follow your heart and then you'll be okay. You know what the Bible tells us? Following our heart is the greatest disaster we can ever do. The Bible says that the heart is deceitful and is wicked above all things. You see, if we just follow the desires of our hearts, we will do the wrong thing time and time and time again. The Bible gives us light. His word is light. It's a light unto my path. And it gives us truths and principles by which we know what pleases God and how we can have a successful life. Now, success is not just measured by wealth and what I gain. That's what the world says. But let me tell you, success is by living life, meeting our purpose that God has designed for us, doing it well to his good pleasure, and being fully satisfied in what we are and who we are and what we do. God has transformed us. He has translated us from this kingdom of darkness, of confusion, of doubt, of not knowing into his marvelous light, into his great kingdom. Uh, you know what, if God has done this for you and for me, we ought to choose to walk in light. Uh, let us not go back and walk in darkness again. You know, it's a sad fact that somebody who's come into the light has been illuminated into something that is true and right, still chooses to go back and live the old way. And that ought not to be so, friend. God has done a miraculous work in transforming you out of this world, out of this great darkness that is in this world, and put you in his marvelous light and in his kingdom uh, that is by his grace. H how is it that we choose to go back and do the things that are in the world? We have something to be thankful for. Lord, thank you for giving me your light. Lord, thank you for transforming my life out of this kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your great son. Number, uh, in verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Well, there's something I need to be thankful for here. I have been redeemed. I have been redeemed. The word redeem, to be redeemed, is to buy back. To buy back. Well, why did God have to buy back? What, what, what does that mean, that he bought back? Well, you know, we were owned, creation is... God owns creation, correct? And God created you and me. We are owned once through creation. But when our heart, and God's given us the, the free will to choose whether we follow him or we make ourselves our own gods or have another God in our life. And so when humanity began to reject God himself and only obey the lusts of their own flesh and do what only pleases them and and that's what they were guided by. In fact, that was really the sin of Adam and Eve. 
is the sin of Adam and Eve was not because they ate a fruit. No, it was an act of a choice of, uh, of a will that they exercised to say, we'd rather do what we desire rather than to listen to what you have to say. And so that was the choice that was made. And the Bible tells us, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each one into his own way. But God has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Uh, who is him? That was the Lord Jesus. Uh, we all made our choices. We've all gone our own ways. We've all made up ways of how we think we're going to please God. But God brings it all back and says, listen, you, I owned you through creation, but you walked away from me. But I love you. You have intrinsic value to me. And I'm going to buy you back. Now, how is God buying us back? Well, the payment of sin was made through the person of Jesus Christ. Christ paid your, your payment and my payment. Uh, that was a transaction. You see, if, if the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ was just a lovely story uh, that we just think, then we have a problem. We have a problem because God is not satisfied with our righteousness. In fact, the Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah that our righteousness are like dirty, filthy rags. And what is your best? Well, God looks at that and says, that's still not good enough. That's still not good enough. But Christ came to this earth to pay, to represent humanity, you and me, and die in our place. The Bible says that if one died, then we're all dead. But those who now live should not live unto themselves, but live unto him who gave, them, gave his life for them. Hey, let me ask you this morning. Let me ask you this morning. Have you submitted yourself to the Lord and said, yes, Lord, I accept the payment you made for my life? You see, either you're going to stand before God one day and you're going to justify yourself, right? You're going to, you're going to plead your cause, you're going to plead your case, or you're going to go and stand before God and say, I was blood-bought by Jesus Christ. He paid for me. He paid for me. I've been redeemed. He's, he, he's, he brought me back. He's paid for me. So here the word for us, what we need to be thankful for is God loved you and me. God loved you and he wanted to bring you back and he brought you back. He paid a price to win you back and that price was the blood of Christ. And it, I love what the Bible says that this redemption in whom we have what? Forgiveness of sin. The forgiveness of sin. What does it mean to be forgiven? What does it mean to, ha to be forgiven? You know, people think about forgiveness uh, uh, in this way. Well, you know, we, we've sorted it out and we've just got to move on. Uh, forgiveness is more intrinsic than that. Forgiveness is to acknowledge that one has offended the other. And because of that offense, the one who is offended is willing to let go. Is willing to just go over it. Is willing to cover it is willing to say, I will forgive you and I will not remember it anymore. I love what the Bible says. It says that God has removed our sin as far as the east is from the west. Now, what, what does that mean? Well, east and west don't meet, do they? I mean, they're just in separate directions. And God says that I've removed it as far as the east is from the west. Now, when I think about that, I, I just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sin. And not only forgiving it, and not remembering it. In fact, the Bible tells us that God took your sin and put it in the depths of the ocean. In the depths of the ocean. I like what somebody said, I've said, shared this before, and, and God put a sign that says, no fishing. There's no fishing in that place. Nobody's going to dig it out again. God's not going to dig it up again. And I'm thankful for that forgiveness we have in Jesus Christ. We have much to be thankful for. We have much for what God has done. Not, not less, not, 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 not even, we haven't even began to mention about what he's given us in gifts and what he's given us in family and what he's given us in health and what he's given us in jobs and what he's given us in housing and, and uh, you know, warm clothing and cars to drive in. If you begin to comprehend the marvelous grace of God in our life, it's immeasurable. He's done so much. So we ought to be what? People of thanksgiving. We ought to be people who constantly thank God and have thanks on, on, on our lips, thanking the Lord for what he has done. Now, I want to give us some practical, uh, practical applications that will help us today. All right, so how? How can I show my thanksgiving? And certainly Paul addresses that in this uh, little epistle. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Now we're going to look at, well, what are the 
practical ways I can show that I'm thankful to the Lord. What things can I do? Verse 6 and 7 of chapter 2 says, And as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built, in, built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with, what's that word? Abounding with? It's on the page, not on my face. It's thanksgiving. All right, good. Thank you, Angela. It's with thanksgiving. So here is one way that we show and we demonstrate our thanksgiving. When we are rooted and being established in the Lord and in his word. You see, God did never, did, never intended for Christians to be tumbleweeds. Right? God never intended for you to be tossed to and fro from one doctrine to another doctrine, from this faith to that faith. And God wanted you to, he illuminated you to the truth of his word and then said, once you know that, get grounded and get rooted in it. Get to know me, get to know my word, be established in my word. And when you do that, when you're established and you're rooted, uh, then you're demonstrating thanksgiving to the Lord. You're saying, Lord, I understand what you've shown me and I'm going to be grounded in it. You see, when you keep changing your mind about things, God is not pleased with that. In fact, the Bible says in the book of James, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You see, God doesn't want you to be unstable. God doesn't want you to be tossed to and fro. God wants you to be rooted and established. And once you begin your Christian life, you must start taking root. Taking root. That is, start going down deep in your relationship with the Lord. Hey, God is not after a superficial uh, relationship. God doesn't want you to say, well, on Sunday I'm a Christian and, and I hold my Bible and I know how to say amen and praise you, Jesus. And, uh, but during the week, you're really not living for him. You're not even rooted in his word to apply his word in your life. You see, if, we are going to be, if we're going to be people of thanksgiving, then we're going to be people who are obedient to his word. Obedience shows our thanksgiving. Knowing God, knowing his word, we are, and practicing it in our life, we demonstrate our thanksgiving to him. Not only then through my being rooted in the word, let's look at number, uh, another one, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, the Bible says uh, this, verse 14, and above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye what? And be ye thankful. All right, so here we have another way in which we can demonstrate our thankfulness to the Lord. You know what it is? Letting the peace of God rule in our hearts. Letting God's peace. And what is, how do we have the peace of God? When we fulfill his will in our life. And now, how do we have peace of God together as a church? Because it says here, uh, where it says in that verse, uh, um, and the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also ye are called in one body. All right, to have peace, unity in one body. How do we have that? How do we have peace? That, well, when we fulfill the leading, what the leading of the Holy Spirit wants from us, what God wants from us. You see, a divided church, a divided church is a church that is not thankful to what God is doing. Now, you see, when, we, when you experience unity, when you have unity in the church, that is something that, we, that is an expression of our thankfulness for what God and the Spirit of God is doing in our midst. And so, you know, when we make a decision, like this afternoon after this morning service, we're going to come together and make a decision. And I, I've just been encouraging you more to seek the Lord and seek his word and seek his, the leading of the Holy Spirit in this matter. We want to know what does God want us to do. And if we come together and make a choice and a decision together in unity with peace, then we need to be thankful for what God is doing. We're thankful for the peace and unity that he is fulfilling as we know his will for us and we perform it and so there needs to be thanksgiving you know when there is a, when there is unity in the church we need to be thankful we need to say thank you lord you bring peace in our lives you've brought peace in our family you've brought peace in our church family and when we strive for that peace in that unity we are demonstrating thanksgiving with all thanksgiving abounding with thanksgiving so we need to be people who are giving thanks to the Lord. And I want you to see one more uh, in, in his word. Verse, uh, verse 17 
of chapter 3. And, whos- and whatsoever ye do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving what? Giving thanks to God, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. And whatsoever you do, in word or deed, give thanks. And how, how do you do that? How do I do that? How do I do that? Well, you know, when you're doing your job, when you're doing job, don't sit there, murmur and complain and clamor about the tasks that you have to do. You know what you need to be saying? Lord, uh, you gave me this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Lord, uh, uh, what, if I'm going to have a conversation, ha- have a conversation that shows your demonstration of thankfulness to God. I love it when I speak with some Christians who are, who are saying to me, you know, it, I just thank the Lord that he's given me this opportunity. I'm thankful that God has given me this family, has given me this wife, has given me this opportunity, has given me, you know, has given me wealth, has, has done this thing. I'm thankful for what God is doing. And whatever it may be in word or in deed, we ought to do it what? As unto Christ with thanksgiving. Now, many of us are... Comes, it comes naturally to us that uh, we believe that we're more entitled. We don't deserve the task that we've been given. You know, some of you young people, you were told maybe to clean up your room or take your laundry, or and we're like, can't believe it. Like, you know, what's the big deal? Like, what? And we more murmur and complain and clamor rather than to do it with thankfulness, because we're not doing it because we have to do it. Mum and dad told us to do it. We're doing it because we're going to do it unto the Lord. You know, it changes your life, your perspective to life and the things that you involve yourself in can change dramatically if you come with this thinking, I'm doing it for the Lord. I'm not doing it for my boss. I'm not doing it for my parents. I'm not doing it for anybody else. I'm doing this to please the Lord. And so I'm thankful. I'm thankful that the Lord allows me to do this for him. I'm thankful that I can do this for him. I'm thankful that God will allow me to be the best son in the home. I'm thankful that I can be the best daughter in the household. I'm thankful that I can be the best husband. I'm thankful that I can be the best wife. I'm thankful that we could be servants to the Lord and serve him in in the best way we can in our capacity, whether it be doing a ministry. And next week, we're going to have a ministry engagement day. And I pray that you would uh, consider and pray what ministry you'll you'll be doing, but not to do it with murmuring and complaining and say, this is too hard, or I didn't know that it was going to be like this. And uh, uh, if I knew it was like this, I would never sign up. No, let's do it as unto the Lord with thankfulness. With thankfulness. And so we could be people demonstrating our thanks to God by remembering that this is unto the Lord. And lastly, this morning in Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, it says, continuing in prayer and watching the same with thanksgiving. Continue in prayer. We can give thanks to God in our prayers. Uh, when we pray, learn to give thanks to the Lord for what he is doing. And, this is a, and it says with watchfulness, that is to be alert. So, you know, sometimes what we, what we do when we're praying, well, Lord, bless so-and-so, Lord, bless me. Uh, Lord, bless, uh, you know, my husband, bless my children. And, and it just becomes, you know what it becomes? It just becomes repetitive wording. It becomes dull. In fact, it's so dull that we get bored of it ourselves. And what, what do we do? We kind of goes off. And we wake up on the front, oh, I didn't finish my prayer. And uh, where was I? Where was I? I need to go back to where I was and try to finish my prayer. You see, God is not interested in your repetitive praying. God is not interested in praying when it's just the mouthing of words with no alertness to what we are praying for. And so what he is saying is when we pray, pray with alertness. Pray that you are, Lord, I'm engaged, I'm here, this is what I'm doing. And he says, pray with thanksgiving. Being able to give thanks to the Lord. You know, the Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 4, it says, be anxious for nothing, be careful for nothing. Don't get, have panic attacks, don't, get, don't worry, don't have anxiety, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto the Lord. And the Lord, you know what he does? He will give you his peace, which passes all understanding. And so when we pray, we need to be people who give thanks to God in our prayers. You know, if you say, well, Pastor, I, 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 I struggle to pray for five minutes. Let me tell you, if you just write a list of things that you need to be thankful for, you'll go for more than five minutes. That's just thanking God. You haven't even began to pray for your request. Uh, when you just begin to thank him for all that he has done, 
there is much to give thanks to the Lord. And I would encourage you, when you pray, don't go straight into, Lord, help me, Lord, heal me, Lord, give me, Lord, you know, do this and do that. You see, God, God is not our servant. Do you, you, you understand that? Uh, God is not at your beck and call. But I'm thankful that he's give, invited us to come and pray. And so when I come to pray, I want to be thankful first. God, I, I thank you that you answered my prayers. Thank you for what you've done in my life. Thank you, Lord, for the grace you've given me. Thank you for what you've done. Lord, this is all from you. There ought to be thanks in praying. And you know, if we don't pray, then we really haven't given him thanks. Can I just stir your mind and your conscience? It's not sufficient that you've prayed before you ate your burger. Some of us think that, yeah, well, we are thankful we pray before we eat. It's not sufficient that you've given thanks for your food. And you ought to. We as Christians ought to give thanks to the Lord for the meal that he's given us. I mean, that should happen. Uh, some of us are a little bit embarrassed, maybe in a restaurant or in open forums about our heads. You know, uh, I heard a story about a preacher who went to, uh, to a restaurant one time and, and they bowed their heads and they prayed. And he was a farmer. Uh, he was a farmer. And, uh, and uh, as they prayed, they finished. Somebody from the other table snickered and said, do you always do that where you come from? And the farmer turned around and said, no, the pigs don't. You know, we ought to give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to him for what he has done. He's provided much for us. Take time in your prayer to give thanks. Take time in your prayer to give thanks to the Lord. I want to give you this morning, I want to hand you out some cards. Where are my ushers? Uh, I want to give you a, a thank you card. So as they go out and pass these out to you, I think we have enough for everyone. If not, uh, we'll see how we manage that. But I want you to take this card today, and this is what I want you to do. Uh, it's always nice to receive a thank you card, right? Uh, when, uh, when someone just being so thoughtful writes you or gives you a thank you card, okay? And what I would like to, you to do with this uh, thank you card is uh, not so much to think about someone to write a thank you note to, but I want you to take this, uh, this card and I want you to think about thoughtfully, thoughtfully write this card out, but you're going to write it to the Lord. You're going to write this thank you card to the Lord. So, uh, you, you know, maybe don't go straight away and scribbling on the, on the card because you're going to say, oh, I should have said this, I should have said that. And maybe you might want to take a, maybe a scrap paper first and write something out and then, you know, write it out neatly. How many of us do that when you write a card? How many people just write a card straight away? You know, I, I, I sometimes try to write it on the side because if I don't like the way I express it, once, you, you know, once you've written the card, you can't unwrite it, right? How many people have received a card that had liquid paper or you know, marking on it or trying to, it's like, no, 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 no. You know, write it out, understand what you want to write, and then put it on the, the card, the thank you card. So maybe take some time to scribble some notes, scribble some things to understand how or, or what you want to say to the Lord. Now, what are you going to do with this card? Well, you're not going to mail it anywhere, all right? It's not going to, it's, you, you can't, there's no mail going to heaven right now. Uh, you can mail it through your prayers, there's no doubt about that. But this is what I want you to do. This is what, well, you say, why are we doing this exercise, Pastor? Well, because I want you to write this thank you card, and I want you to put it somewhere in your, maybe TV room or in your bedroom, where it might be, somewhere prominent where every time you see it, it's going to remind you that you are thankful. Lord, uh, I wrote this card to you, and I'm thankful. God, I want to be a person who, give thanks, who gives thanks to you. Right? And, and it'd be interesting from time to time, to open that card and just read it and say, you know what? It's true. What God has done, how he saved me, I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for his grace. I'm thankful for what he's done. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for his blessing. I'm thankful even for the trial and the suffering that I'm going right through. I need to remember that I am a person of gratitude and thanksgiving. Write that card out. Put it somewhere. Remember. Every time you see it, remember. Now, do, do me a favor. Don't throw it 
Don't throw it away like what you do with your Christmas cards. Right? You know, we receive Christmas cards and we hang them and, we're, and then once Christmas is over, all right, grab it all and it goes in the bin. Thank you for next year. No, I, I, I just want you to maybe hold on to that somewhere. Uh, hold on to it, not as that it has any, any um, spiritual you know, significance. Uh, all it is is just a reminder. Just put it somewhere where it may remind you. You might maybe put it in your drawer and one day you pull it out and it might remind you. Remind me to be thankful for what God has done in my life. If we're going to be walking pleasing to the Lord, what's going to happen? We're going to be people who bear fruit. We're going to be people who are exposed to God's word to know him, right? We're going to be people who ask for the power of God to endure and to forbear with joyfulness. And this one, this morning, we're going to be people of thanksgiving. Let there be thanksgiving rolling off our tongues all the time rather than murmuring and complaining. Some of us can always see the bad things rather than the good things. Let us give thanks to the Lord. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for what you've done. We ask your Lord a blessing upon each one today. Help us to be reminded of this truth that we be people of thanksgiving. We thank you for your word and the instruction it is to us. Change us, Lord, by your spirit. Help us to, to draw nigh to you. And Lord, we thank you for our salvation. Thank you, Lord, for redeeming us. Thank you, Lord, for transforming us, taking us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of of Jesus Christ into your light, Lord. Uh, and you've qual- you qualified us, Lord. You enabled us. You did all this. We're thankful, Lord, for what you have done today. Help us to be people of gratitude. And we love you, Lord. And we give you thanks this morning. Help every individual today as we go away. Help us to be reminded of this truth. May Satan not rob us of the precious seed of God's word that we have heard. May it be deeply sown in our hearts that it may change us, that we be more like Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.